Hi everyone and welcome to the Imagining a New We video blog with me, Dr. Samantha Cotrera, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. We're continuing our pandemic pedagogy series today with another amazing speaker who will be able to bring so many different perspectives to this conversation. Anna Morell is a senior archivist at the Archives of Ontario, one of the uh, largest, no, the largest provincial archives in Canada, but he also works at small and medium archives as a volunteer, both the Canadian Gay and Lesbian Archives as well as the Thornhill Community Archives. Thornhill is a community just north of Toronto. I was really interested in having Adam come speak to us today, come speak to us, like, anyway, he's just going to beam in, I don't know where he's, anyway, whatever. <laughs> I was really excited to have Adam come and talk with us because of the fact that he works with these small community organizations and he thinks about collections and records differently because of his work in these small and medium archives as well as his work at this large, large archives. I really question the things about like these small community organizations and these um, community archives. How are they collecting things? How are they making things accessible? How can we as history educators better use their materials? So I'm really excited to have this conversation. Let's go over to Adam. Adam, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I think that your perspective as a senior archivist, but also someone so involved in community archiving can bring so much uh, different depth to this conversation. So thank you so much for making time to talk with me today. You're very welcome. Thank you for asking me. This is great. Yeah, I, um, I, I've been thinking a lot about small community organizations and how they are understanding their work during this time. And my first question is kind of like this big, this big question about history. Like, have you thought about history any different because of this time? And I wonder how that impacts or that shapes uh, or intersects with your work, both in like a big provincial archives, but also with these small community organizations. It, it is interesting to, you know, uh, in, in both settings, we're very much surrounded by records and the legacy of previous health uh, epidemics and, and pandemics uh, in both Archives of Ontario setting as well as uh, the archives uh, setting formerly Canadian Lesbian and, Ar Lesbian and Gay Archives. Uh, in the provincial archives setting, we do have records that concern the 1918 uh, Spanish flu epidemic. And, you know, kind of up until this moment uh, for us, you know, looking at those images of people wearing masks and uh, public notices about, uh, you know, keeping safe and, and public health initiatives seem very distant. And now we're having our own moment of that, so to speak. And so it really brings those moments really close. It's a lot easier to relate to what people were going through then. And um, now we're walking through the streets and through our grocery stores in 2020 wearing masks and seeing people wearing masks and having the same fears and anxieties that people must have experienced just over a century ago. Um, in the the archives setting, um, you know, volunteer, uh, uh, smaller, medium-sized archives, if you will, you know, we have, you know, the legacy, the very tragic legacy of the AIDS crisis uh, for that community. And um, as someone who is too young to remember the uh, 1980s portion of that, it's, uh, you know, it's being in somebody made somebody likened um you know in, in the newspaper uh you know pages of obituaries in in mm -hmm. 2020 and, and how we've never seen this before and it's like well actually we have mm -hmm. and it kind of uh, it's it, that that the, the lgbt community has seen this and has experienced this and uh it is within living memory in the way that the 1918 pandemic is largely not but um yeah, it, it is interesting to when you haven't witnessed those personally how going through this experience brings the experiences of those two very significant events to uh, the forefront and you can relate to them very much more readily. 
Yeah, it's it's uh, interesting that you brought up the AIDS crisis in the 1980s because I also have been thinking about that a lot and how um, the AIDS crisis put so much fear and anxiety um, in the gay and lesbian community, um, even just about like like being out, right? Like you couldn't go to the bars in the same way. You couldn't meet people, especially if you weren't out to your family. And, um, and like that undercurrent of fear and anxiety that if you are not a member of that community, you can very well not think of that history but that this moment is so much of this fear and anxiety for so many more people. And when I say that I think about history differently in this moment, I think about how it's so easy for us to ignore or discount this giant thing that happened in the 1980s, the giant fear, because it doesn't seem like we have the records, but we do have the records. They are just in different places and places we might not think of going to get teaching and learning materials, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, those two, the, the, some people have tried to draw perhaps too closely parallel connections between those, uh, the, the AIDS crisis and today, and there's a lot of significant differences, um, mainly the immediacy sure. of public response to it uh, was very different. Um, and as you allude to the uh, experiences of the individual, how people, you know, there was that added layer then of uh, homophobia and um, people being closeted and not being able to talk about their uh, experiences um, where today because this is a, a you know, society-wide issue if you will uh, rather than a uh, community uh, issue uh, which was ignored for a long time in the AIDS, uh, AIDS circumstance um, they, they are very different but there are you know some similarities for sure and uh, it is interesting to think about that and it makes you think differently about that time period as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like, I think that is what is so rich in this moment as a teaching moment, how it really should force us to reconsider so many different points of history and the narratives that we think we know about them. Yeah. Um, so maybe could you talk about if you think teaching history might change after this? Now, I know you aren't directly a history educator, but because you are an archivist and you work with large and, and smaller and medium-sized archives, you, you are dealing with and you're exploring the stuff of so much teaching and learning. Do you think the way that we will be able to mobilize these records, be able to teach with these records, might shift and change after this time? I do, and I think that the expectations around access will change considerably. Mm -hmm. They already have been changing for a long time, but I mean, right now we, we're talking now be, uh, over video conference because we can't meet in person. Um, that's, I mean, that's a, an easier thing to, to mobilize and do, and I'm sure lots of people are using video conferencing who have never used it before. I know in my parents, <laughs> we get to the <laughs> right. so first, their first time. Um, but in terms of access to resources, uh, the expectations are changing even more than they have before. Uh, and I think, I don't know that we'll go back to normal, if you will, after that. I think we, we, we've crossed maybe another threshold in terms of demand for online access to resources. We've seen that in libraries, we've seen that in museums who are literally virtually opening their doors to virtual tours of their institutions who may never have done that before or at least not in to the extent. As an archivist, um, whether it is, you know, the collection of the size of the Archives of Ontario or a medium-sized archives like the archives or a very small uh, Thornhill Archives collection, which is a, by all definitions, a very small collection, each of those have their own resource challenges. I mean, we, the Archives of Ontario is, in many respects, very well resourced, um, but it's, it's a matter of scale and we're, perhaps under-resourced when you look at the size of the collection that we have to meet the increasing demands of prov providing online access to even the materials that are open access. Um, so it is going to be interesting to see as this continues and after the immediacy of the crisis is over, uh, increased calls for you know photographs and films and other and, and cartographic records, architectural records being put online um, so that 
you know, our increasingly online uh, world uh, can meet that demand. I mean, uh, we have video chats uh, every week with uh, my colleagues. Many of them have children and they talk about their kids using Google Classrooms and other online learning modules. Um, and so it, it's only a matter of time before this, this demand for online, online learning is going to bump up against uh, archival library and museum resources being similarly available online. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Uh, this is purely from the, you know, approaching the, from the pr practical standpoint of, of resources and bringing what is really, and, and as long as we've had a digital world where our collections are still majority analog and, and this is going to take, take time. So it, from a, you know, collections management archivist perspective, that is, it's kind of scary because uh, we want to be able to meet those those challenges but uh, it will take it will take time well I'm, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about a small archives like the Thornhill archives how does this shift how you and the other volunteers um, might think about your work because I think about how much labor and how much cost uh, goes into digitizing things it, it seems easy because we all have our phones so close but it's not it's mm -hmm. not this easy cheap free thing it's not, um, and and it, it. I think it's it. It might br bring calls to increase that training and capacity at different levels. And one one little project that we've discussed locally, which has <laughs> actually been discussed at a fourth organization that I'm uh, sort of tangentially involved with, uh, as sort of an advisor capacity, uh, a, a small house museum heritage center that has a archival collection that actually has been digitized through student effort a couple of summers ago and up until now there has been sort of casual chit chat about involving seniors who could from the comfort of their own home uh, transcribe those letters to make them more accessible and it's something we've only talked about up until this this point but well now everyone's in their own home we have those tiff images sitting on hard drives um, and we're starting to talk about actually moving forward with that project. Uh, it has been on the back burner because everyone's been busy with their lives. And now that we have more time at our disposal, we're actually looking at moving forward with that transcription project. So it, it's been a nudge, it will. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. a tiny uh, example of where this, uh, this pandemic, which has affected many different people in different ways, has uh, pushed a little project forward. Mm -hmm, mm hmm This question seems like a leading question, like we've rehearsed it beforehand, but it's not. So, <laughs> so I so I apologize if it throws you off, which I now realize makes it extra scary. But I think of like a small community um, archives that if people are interested in donating their records to, especially older people, there's kind of this vision of what an archives is. Do you think it's going to with a move online, do you think it's going to shift people's um, willingness, but also like um, understanding of what it means to donate if uh, if things are going to go up online? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that you know that we've been aware of some time. You know, archivists have long been aware of our public perception. Uh, you know the, <laughs> the the creature in in the basement over the dusty records is something is a uh, an image that we've been all too happy to shed, but uh, there is some persistence uh, to that. Uh, with the march towards, I mean, we're already in the midst of it, but you know, with archives, everything lags behind. Uh, we're, we're increasingly getting electronic records more and more, and there there is that fear that, you know, one of the great motivations of archival donation is, you know, the cupboards are full, the the shelves are full, the filing cabinets are full. Well. With digital storage becoming so cheap, if you fill up a hard drive and just buy another hard drive, where is your incentive? And so that actually pushes us to be more, uh, you know, we have to be a lot more uh, diligent and a lot more active in terms of approaching donors, whether they are new people or organizations that we want to approach or people that we haven't heard from in 10 or 20 years. And I say, well, we want your archives and we want not only the files that you may have in the drawer, but also the materials you have on your hard drive. Uh, your email accounts, that's a really challenging one to motivate people because yeah. they think of their email as theirs. That's mine. You know, that's those aren't business records. That's my email. And, and in some cases, the 
uh, distinction is very blended, especially if you're talking about volunteer organizations where the, the evidence of your involvement is literally intermixed with your correspondence with your family. Those are, those are much wider challenges that have been around for longer than this moment we're in now. But it, it does bring to the forefront other, other things that have been happening. Um, you know, we've seen people uh, create records of this moment, take fo taking photos of boarded up windows along streets where there used to be open businesses and now there's a street that's empty of people. Uh, there's been such a jarring change in the accessibility and, and fullness of our landscape in terms of people and activity that people are documenting that. People are taking photos of closed signs, of public health notices, um, you, people wearing masks, you, you name it. And people are becoming much more aware of becoming record creators. And um, it's, it's something that we as archivists at the AO, for instance, have been talking about the importance of documenting that this particular moment, not necessarily the full, complete archival lives of these individuals and businesses, but kind of a cross-section of the documentation of this particular moment. Um, and U of T, for example, has a web archiving initiative to document COVID-19 uh, response and messaging, and the AO has been uh, getting involved with that to a certain extent. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, it, it does make you think differently about capturing records and really think differently about the process of, of archiving a particular moment, which maybe is different than approaching an individual or an organization about, you know, your full archival history. Yeah, like, I think that it, like, this moment is able to reveal a lot of different things about the historicity of kind of normal interactions. Um, mm -hmm. And it might encourage people to, to want to be able to uh, have that as a more public or open record either now or in the future as a way to identify that like that, that this is this is who I was in this moment this was my response. That's right and what's interesting is I've seen sites where people have been collecting photos you can there are some sites you can go to and submit your own photos of photos of you know streets of, of the changing environment we're in and and how people are experiencing that and on the one hand it's really great people are, are gathering that people are saving it um but you know as are, are just like um digital records and 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 uh the online environment is much more fragile than the, than the analog environment and at least in the short term uh one thing i wonder you know about those kind of resources if we approach people who are, are building those resources and say, we want to archive this and document this. I wonder about the response. Is it, well, that's what I've been doing. You know, uh, it's online, it's already documented, it's already captured. And I think it calls to us as information professionals in the widest sense to um, come in with wearing our preservation hat, wearing our our, our knowledge of the, lot, the risk to digital records. And that really in, in a year from now, are we going to see the same things surviving online and uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, wherever these things have been captured in the moment, um, there is an inherent risk to them as uh, resources that uh, are not like taking a roll of film and sticking it into a drawer or saving posters in a drawer that you can find in 20 years from now. Uh, there is a much more immediacy to the need to preserve these, uh, these digital objects. Mm -hmm. And something that Chris Sanigan, an archivist that I interviewed earlier, talked about is about the how much there is going to be and the value of them and how to think through those things, um, to think through the, the meaning and significance when, like, I can literally take a thousand pictures of my day today, will that demonstrate uh, what the COVID pandemic was for everyone in Toronto? 100% no, but I still have the thousand photos, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the, the volume is is a huge factor, um, and and as archivists, you know, we go through a lot of uh, a lot of process. I mean, we're a government archives process is what we do. Um, <laughs> uh, speaking with my AO hat on, um, and we go through a lot of uh, appraisal to determine what it is that we're going to acquire. I think in order to respond effectively to this, and it's a lot. Some of this is already happening in, in many other institutions. Um, I, I saw uh, a National Post article that talked about the different organizations that are documenting COVID in different ways, whether that's institutionally, regionally, nationally. 
um, and, and they have sort of been focusing on different areas that, you know, we're not going to be looking at documenting this, you know, collecting, you know, one person's uh, photos or an organization's uh, Twitter account. Uh, it's really going to be a cross section, you know, you talk looking about universities that document hashtags mm -hmm. and, and, you know, sometimes it's an event, sometimes it's, uh, uh, in, in, you know, an, an occurrence of some kind where you actually take all the tweets or all the um, records that document that and it's a different way it's certainly a, a way that is largely foreign from an archival standpoint because we want to document foam we want to document all the the, the activities of life and existence of an organization or a person but that might not be the best way to document COVID-19 in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be a slice of how we document things differently. Yeah, and, and for me as a history educator too, I, I think about the ways that we can link stories to these records as a way to demonstrate how, because we can be very hyper aware of this notion of recording, that mm -hmm. if we're attaching stories to the records that we want to make public, then we can help kind of narrate um, a particular version that we are trying to show, even if historians down the line will, will challenge that and ship that, but we can kind of connect it with that. And for, so, so this leads to my third question, because for me, one of the really amazing things about primary sources is that it can really, they can really highlight how, and this is something I've talked about in um, a Canada's History webinar, which I will link above. Um, but like, it shows that we were there and it shows that they were there. Like for me, primary sources can really, challenge so many notions that we expect about history and this is why i say that we need to imagine a new we we need to be more aware of the of the we together um, that i think we get in our heads a particular narrative about the past that primary sources can really challenge so i end this this little three question interview by asking people do you think that the ways that we're going to imagine um, or imagine a new we will shift and change after this moment? Um, and if so, in what ways? And if, if not, uh, why not? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I, and I think that a big part of this is not about subjects that we're documenting or uh, what's the best way to say this? From a, a provincial archives perspective, I think we're, we're pretty confident we're, we're going to be preserving the public health, the public messaging, mm -hmm. the policy behind this, um, but that's far from enough. And uh, we need to make sure that we're documenting a diversity of voices uh, here in order to responsibly capture a record of this, this moment in time, which uh, can be very fleeting. I know it, it, we're, as we're you know, sitting at home, working from home, hopefully working from home. Uh, you know, it can seem like it's going on forever, but really this is a, a short moment. Hopefully it will be a short moment. It is so important that we capture a diversity of voices, um, the individual, you know, hopes and fears, whether that is, you know, Twitter messages, um, people who have been responding to this from a professional standpoint, doctors and nurses, uh, frontline people, people working in grocery stores, um, uh, migrant workers who are encountering issues around protecting their own health while they're uh, doing doing their jobs. Um, so it's really documenting a diversity of voices in this space, um, not just the official messaging that I think is going to be hopefully plentiful in terms of what we're able to preserve in this moment. Um, and so that really is our challenge as well. And it doesn't mean that every institution needs to do everything, but uh, there's an important element of working together. Um, institutions need to work um, with each other to make sure that, all right, maybe you've got this piece of it, maybe you've got this piece. And, um, you know, we're, we're as, an, as an organization, part of the uh, Provincial Acquisition Strategy with the Archives Association of Ontario. And um, I have no doubt that as this goes forward, there will be, there will be discussions about, you know, regional archives documenting this regionally, local archives documenting this locally. Um, you know, sort of taking taking the appropriate um, steps to capture what is sort of within your realm, but also making sure that you're filling in the gaps that maybe you um, hadn't considered. So it, it, it does require a creative response for sure. 
Yeah, and for me, what I, I heard there too is how important it is that we are aware that that different archives aren't designed to um, to archive the same material. Like they're not designed to do everything. And how important it is to work with like uh, uh, work with different types of archives in order to tell a more full story of who we are together. Um, so thank you so much about bringing those different perspectives. I think it's so important for us to be cognizant of the, the work of archivists in helping to shape how we shape how we mobilize history and in essence then the histories that we are able to teach and learn. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, this is really great. And um, I'm gonna provide all the links um, to the different organizations you work with below and um, any other things that you think are useful. Just got very windy here. <laughs> any else <laughs> things that you think it will be useful for people to kind of understand this moment or to record this moment. Um, so thank you again. You're very welcome. Thanks, Samantha. <laughs> okay, we'll uh, talk later. Bye. All right, bye-bye.